back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections here on a given Monday. And today we're talking about looking at American diplomacy in Southeast Asia with uh, retired Air Force General Dan Leaf. Hi, Dan. Thank you for joining us. Aloha, Jay. Always a pleasure. Someday we'll do this in person again. I hope so. I hope it's soon. <laughs> so do so, I. You know, I think one of the one of the big things that dawned on me in my in my military experience, after that matter, my civilian experience, was that sometime after Vietnam, the military became involved in diplomacy. All mm -hmm. of a sudden, we find senior officers are actually engaging with senior officials in Vietnam and elsewhere, um, trying to do soft power, trying to engage with them. Dan in Norway was behind that. It's one of the reasons uh, that he founded your school, APCSS, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. Um, and as, you know, uh, he did a lot to uh, advance us in that regard, but the military has been more important all the time and you have been on that wave. So can you talk about it? Can you talk about how the military has become, um, you know, a sort of a, an advanced um, diplomat, a, a military diplomat, if you will, in the last few decades? Sure, Jay. First, a little truth in advertising. Uh, I was the director at APCSS until January 2017. So sadly, it's no longer my school. Rear, Rear Admiral retired Pete Gumatauta is uh, doing fantastic work as the current director fixing things that I broke. So, <laughs> but, but I don't know that that's new, but there are some new examples of the military role in diplomacy and one of the most significant experiences I had both in the military and at APCSS was, was with Vietnam. And it all starts with people. Um, so if you'll permit me, I'll tell a quick story. I think I have a picture of the guy I'm gonna talk about who started all of this, um, General Nguyen Duc Swat, if we can bring that photo up. That's uh, me in Hanoi in 2007, I believe, with General Swat giving a coin to just one of the Vietnamese soldiers. General Swat was a, a Vietnamese Air Force fighter pilot who shot down six U.S. airplanes, so he was the enemy. Uh, he led the first military delegation to visit the U.S., and I met him at Pacific Command when I was a deputy. He, he is a rock star in it, still today in the Vietnamese military because of his performance in combat. When he came to Camp Smith with a big delegation, he um, we met him at the door. Admiral Fallon was the commander. I was with him. And of course, Admiral Fallon rightfully acknowledged his General Swat's distinguished combat record. And General Swat's reply through a translator was, thank you, but I'm here to talk about the future, not the past. Now, General Swat's become a very close friend. He's a great guy, I, but he is about the future, not the past. And my assessment broadly is that that's a characteristic of the Vietnamese. And I remind our viewers that I'm not a scholar, I'm, I'm an observer. Um, so I do some research, but a lot of this is based on my travels to almost every country in Indo-Asia Pacific. They're just- And you've done a lot of research uh, in, in sure. order to write all those articles you've written. Yeah. Very prolific yeah, so I, in, in writing about this subject. I try not to get things wrong, so I <laughs> validated. But when General Swat said that, you know, we he and I just hit it off. And they spent a long day at uh, Pacific Command headquarters talking about search and rescue support and meteorological information sharing, which was part of, within the limits of what U.S. national policy allowed us to talk about at the time. So we did that. And then we went to a dinner on the Admiral's Barge and toured Fort Island, uh, saw the Arizona Memorial at sunset. It's something we do for, uh, PACOM does for visiting dignitaries, very moving for everybody. On that uh, dinner cruise, if you will, was a Vietnamese two-star who frankly was a hardline army guy, not pro-US. And he and I got into a discussion after dinner about the South China Sea. This is back in late 2006, I believe. And they were very worried then about Chinese activity in the South China Sea. You know, China is their big neighbor. So, you know, they, they have to be considerate, but they're also concerned at the same time. And he, this general wanted to know my, our plans, should China get more aggressive in the South China Sea? 
And I wasn't about to share them with them, obviously. I said, we're, we're monitoring the situation. We'll respond appropriately. It will depend very much on the circumstances. That was not good enough for this general. And he, he got pretty upset. And I got pretty testy with him, too. And we closed the evening not as friends. Well, the Army, the two-star general went to his quarters on Fort Island that evening, had a major heart attack, and nearly died. Uh, they rushed him to Tripler, performed a quadruple bypass, saved his life. That's the good news. The bad news is the rest of the delegation had to leave with their translator, and he's stuck in what he considers the enemy hospital having nearly died, unable to communicate, doesn't speak a word of English, and under the Vietnamese system, he was going to have to pay the medical bills, which would have, you know, by virtue of proportion, left him, him and his family destitute in perpetuity. But we did what Americans do. We put, Admiral Fallon directed that a translator be stationed at his bedside 24-7, slept on a cot next to him. Uh, we went visit him, took flowers, took books of Hawaii, did the things that Americans do as, as a fundamentally compassionate people, regardless of what we think about this past few years. We are. And then Admiral Fallon did two bits of extraordinary diplomacy. The first was when he recovered, when General Hoy recovered enough to fly back to Vietnam, Admiral Fallon arranged for him to be flown back on a US military medical evacuation airplane. And the second thing was, and I don't know how he did it, I do know it was legal because we had good lawyers at Pacific Command. He arranged for the State Department to pick up the medical bills. General Hoy, previous hardliner, became the primary advocate for improved U.S.-Vietnam military-to-military relationships. And that's how it starts with people. And I think when we see the Vietnamese as they are now and they see us as we are now, we're able to reconcile our very difficult past. And it's a recently difficult past. These are not centuries-old animosities. This is 60, 70 years, 60 years ago. So... Um, that was an important step and led to a lot of military to military engagement, which directly influenced the opportunities uh, for and willingness to conduct uh, civil relationships. And I saw that in person at APCSS. Yeah, that's what largely it, that's what APCSS is about. I don't know if people realize uh, that its mm -hmm. mission is is pretty much what you've been talking about. Can you describe it? Well, it uh, promotes uh, relationships and uh, productive interaction across the Indo-Asia Pacific region with alumni from every country in Asia Pacific except North Korea so far. And uh, it does that through a series of uh, courses and workshops, alumni engagement and other activities that involve senior military and uh, senior to mid-level military and civilian leaders, like I said, from every country except North Korea. And it does it with the Aloha spirit. So I know the Aloha spirit is, is real because I've been to 72 countries, I think, and almost every US state and territory. And there's nothing like it. And we use the, I'm sorry, I still say we about the institution that I love, but APCSS uses it to promote productive and positive interaction instead of argument. It doesn't mean they, they don't discuss difficult things there, but it's a productive discussion. And I have um, another Vietnam example when we want to get to it. Yeah, uh, sure. It's part of the same thread. I mean, we're talking about how the military, uh, to its credit and to the credit of the nation, gets involved in diplomacy and improves diplomacy by personal relations, uh, sometimes with military people uh, in Vietnam or otherwise. Uh, where those military relationships turn into civilian relationships and thus exactly. diplomatic relationships. Uh, it's a great contribution to our connection with the world, our global leadership, if you will. But le let us talk about uh, you know, the other example you had in mind about Vietnam. So uh, we welcomed a thousand or more visitors at APCSS every year uh, when I uh, was the director and could be a president could be a four-star general or admiral or a lower level uh, delegation, but the visitor program was very important. On December 12th, 2012, 
I welcomed uh, Minister Kwan, the chairman of external engagement of the Communist Party of Vietnam. And the government and the Communist Party are separate entities, and I won't begin to try to give a seminar on that today. <laughs> but this is an important guy, and he was the first CPV member to visit in an official capacity the United States. And I got a photo of a pivotal moment of that. Got lots of pictures. And that's Minister Kwan with the dark hair as I greeted him at the entryway of APCSS. And for our viewers who don't know, it's right there on Fort Daruzzi. It's a beautiful location and that matters. Uh, it's, it's part of what works about the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, more properly the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center mm, for Security right, Studies. Yes. So Minister Kwan and his delegation pulled up dressed as you see. Well, our duty uniform at APCSS is an Aloha shirt and I'm in it. And when he pulled up, I could, I just had a sense that he was thinking, do you not know who I am? Dude, you're wearing an Aloha shirt. So I explained that and that the Aloha spirit was what allowed us to have leaders from India and Pakistan and China and Korea and name any bad relationship get together and uh, and have productive discussions. And he bought that, I think. Uh, and then I pointed out to him that that was the 40th anniversary of the heaviest day of bombing of North Vietnam by the US. And here, 40 years later, we were talking about cooperation. And his the guy translating on my right there is Bui Ti Jong, a senior official in the CP. Communist Party of Vietnam and sort of his deputy. <laughs> Zhang is a great guy. What a wonderful friend now. And uh, BTG, as I call him, said, I know because 40 years ago today, I was sitting on a 57 millimeter anti-aircraft gun shooting at American airplanes. And I said, well, that's interesting because I've been shot at by 57 millimeter, <laughs> not yours, but I bet we have a very different uh, view of that entire dealio. And so we had an old warrior discussion. And uh, Zhang, or Quan, the minister, had not did not have military experience. And he was taken by that. And we had a great visit. And this was his first stop of a visit that included Pacific Command and Washington, D.C. Great visit. And it led directly to uh, a visit of the uh, Secretary General of the Communist Party of Vietnam to see President Obama in the White House. It started right there. It started with the Aloha spirit, with a people-to-people -people, uh, conversation, and building a relationship. One of the one of the great days of my life, frankly. Did Did he get into Aloha shirts? Uh, I I took him an Aloha shirt when I went back to Vietnam. <laughs> ETG naturally. And uh, he attended a course later at APCS, as Bui T. Jong did. So they they get it. It's a little hard to ease them into it sometimes. One of the uh, charming things that I that I remember about APCSS is that you would take people from different countries, uh, representatives from different countries, military, civilian, what have you, and you'd put them in uh, condo rooms in Waikiki to four, stay four, there during the course. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be from the same country, nor would they necessarily be from friendly countries. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and you put them in a situation where they had to be friendly. They were sharing a condo apartment. And this was very valuable, you know, in terms of building relationships, not only between these particular officials and the United States, but between these particular officials and those particular yeah. countries. And there was nothing accidental about that, Jay. Uh, it started with uh, the late, uh, Lieutenant General Hank Stackpole, a great guy, and his deputy, Army Colonel retired Dr. Jimmy Lackey. Jimmy Lackey was really the genius behind how APCSS started up, but it was all very intentional. Who we put where, what our activities were, and the courses always include social activities that are designed to build bridges, not burn them. Yeah. Well, I think one of the, this, the, Vietnam is a great story. And when you think of yes. uh, the way the United States treated Vietnam in general, in policy and immigration, for example, uh, after the war, um, it's remarkable. And think of our art, how, how we, um, you know, re remember Miss Saigon, uh, what a fabulous way mm -hmm. of describing the relationship and describing the, 
the turmoil of the relationship in those years. Um, and, and for sure, it's a success story because now, look, they are yes, our absolutely. friends. And, uh, and it's a complicated friendship. And I think the, that it begins, Jay, with the similarities between the two peoples. And as I said, I'm not a scholar, maybe an am amateur international psychologist. I don't know how to describe <laughs> it, but, but I think we're very similar people. We care more about the future than the past, generally. We're both fiercely independent. Both populations are very skeptical of their governments, naturally skeptical, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, focused a lot on our community, uh, not necessarily before family, but there is a municipal focus to both societies, and it, and it fits, and they have a great sense of humor. They have the best sense of humor in Asia, and I say that because they laugh at my jokes, and I'm a funny guy, so, but, but there, there is, it's a, it's a country where I, as an American, am very comfortable uh, with just being there. Um, so that that works, but then it took the hard work. We reestablished diplomatic relations with them in 1995, and we're in a real good place as as a bilateral relationship, strategic uh, partners, if you will, um, not allies, not treaty allies, and they have to balance everything do they do with considerations. They're big neighbor, um, but the hard work has involved addressing things that. That are really tough things, uh, Agent Orange and its effect on Vietnam and our veterans. POW MIA, unexploded ordnance from the war, not easy stuff. U.S. concerns about human rights in Vietnam. It, it, it's been a lot of hard work, and that hard work continues to this day. But again, it's focused on the future, and other countries that can't do that. Um, Suffer for. Okay, I I, I just uh, want to talk about uh, the role of the military in all this, because mm -hmm. it strikes me that uh, you know so much of our relationship with Vietnam is in in the in the memory of the war, um, and it is therefore fitting and appropriate for the military to be uh, on the front line in terms of um, mm -hmm. you know uh, doing. Ho'o pono pono, you know, and coming together again with them. But it demonstrates that the military is well able to do that. The senior officers involved understand the existing relationships. They understand the notion of diplomacy and they understand how, how to make friends um, and how to, and as in your case, how to continue those friendships. It's those continued friendships that bond the two countries together. But, but query, isn't this the job of the State Department? Uh, where is the State Department when you look at this, this phenomenon? The State Department is absolutely in the middle of it. And the military doesn't replace it, it complements it. Now, there are things that, the, first of all, we have a lot of military people around the region and sometimes in Vietnam uh, doing collaborative work, but also it's very easy to form uh, an instant bond when you're both military, regardless of country. And I think that's different. Diplomats come from different backgrounds. Um, it just doesn't happen as quickly when SWAT and I met, General SWAT and I met. You know, we could both talk about flying combat. And uh, he, you know, he had actually shot down a guy I flew up fours with. His, his son later worked for me as an F-15 pilot. And, um, you know, that was the past. And, and I think uh, I spoke at a conference in Washington, D.C. on women, peace and security once, and to a skeptical audience made the point that I think the most compassionate people I've met are those people who've seen real combat, real in the middle of it combat. Because mm -hmm. it, when you see the worst, you accentuate the best. Um, so yeah. I, I think that works. And, you know, Jay, when we try to reconcile any problem throughout the world, internal or between countries, we usually have truth and reconciliation com commissions. Um, and that's a useful process. But my view is if you have too much truth, you won't get to reconciliation. 
because the truth, the accounting for what happened, while not unimportant, can't be your preeminent focus because you'll never get to reconciliation. You have to get over it. And I think military people are naturally inclined to moving on, and we've seen that through the years. The U.S., uh, Germany militaries work well together with Japan, and uh, you know the only former adversary we haven't reconciled with is North Korea. Yeah, I, and um, see, uh, you know, this this must be some somewhat stressful, because you know you have the skill, the personal skills, and the common background, uh, for example, with uh, these these military people in Vietnam. And yet, you know, you're doing a, a diplomacy thing. In the case of Admiral Fallon, uh, handling uh, handling that that uh, Vietnam mm -hmm. officer um, and taking care of him, so as he should remember what happened. Everyone around him should remember what happened in terms of American soft power for the rest of their lives. It throws a long shadow, and it it, it it's a gift that keeps on giving. But query at the moment, the moment of contact. There you are in a meeting. You really have to call on skills beyond personal skills. You have to be representing the United States. You have to know about United States policy. And, and I wonder what kind of experience that is. Is it something where you call the State Department first? Is it something you get trained for? There's a military officer, senior military officer, who is engaging with officials in a foreign country, get briefed by American uh, intelligence, by American diplomacy, before he goes into that discussion? Yes, of course. So for example, at Pacific Command, there is a POLAD, political advisor uh, from the State Department, generally a, a very senior guy, sometimes an ambassador, or somebody who's about to be an ambassador. And they're on the staff and they're a key advisor. They travel with the commander, sometimes the deputy, but they also educate the entire staff. And when you, whether as a senior military officer or as the director of APCS, has I visited 36 countries. And the, the visits always started with interaction at the embassy, most often directly with the ambassador to know what their priorities, what any were and what any um, tripping points might be, what any concerns might be. And, th and then you just do what's right. And I didn't, I didn't think it was very stressful. Maybe I was too naive, but try to do the right <laughs> thing and make the world a better place. So, you know, there must be a lot of lessons that you have learned that you have seen um, in these discussions, meetings, and relationships. And, um, you know, I, I just wonder if they apply to other countries in the same way, clearly they have succeeded in dealing with Vietnam. Um, some countries are more friendly than others. Uh, uh, most countries we have not had wars with, so the military uh, under, 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 you know, under uh, the military common denominator there may not be the same. And I wonder what we have learned, what, what you have seen, what we have learned from the military point of view, and probably from the diplomatic point, point of view as well, uh, and to, to deal with other countries in Asia, Southeast Asia, and Asia in general. Some of them might be easier based on our background, for example, sure. Japan, although that began in a war. Um, and some of them might be harder, like China. China's hard, uh, very you know, sophisticated issues. And yet, um, this is something we need to do. We may, not have, we may not have paid attention to it properly over the past few years, but now certainly for our own interest, we should. So what can you say are the lessons we have learned? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't know that we haven't paid attention to it because the work goes on. There's always change in administrations and policy and focus and all that, but the work goes on and we don't leave the region. Um, I, my preeminent lesson as I went started doing things like this came from General Swat, focus on the future. And so you could go to places like Vietnam and have people who want to talk about the past. And, and you have to deal with it, but the focus has to be on what's best for both countries in the future. And I've got a picture of me coming out of a tunnel, a Kuchi tunnel, uh, if we could bring that up. Those are the tunnels dug by the, Vietnam, the Vietnamese uh, near Saigon, the un unbelievable network. I always refused to go to war memory sites 
museums, the Hanoi Gold. That's, that's not why I'm here would be my point. So no, you've got to go to the tunnels. And I finally, um, I don't know, fifth or sixth visit said, all right, we'll go to the tunnels. It turned out they wanted me to go to the tunnels because it was a, a rite of passage as to how far you could crawl through the tunnels. It had nothing to do with the war, but you've got to focus on the future. The second thing, and uh, this may sound uh, arrogant, it's absolutely not arrogant. Being American, we're, we're a good, compassionate country at the core. And we are a nation formed on ideals, which when we live up to them, are compelling to others. They may not be able to emulate them for a variety of reasons. They may not be willing to adopt our ideals, but the US is a compelling country. And we saw that after the Boxing Day tsunami relief. The US relief to the region had an incredible impact, probably still to this day, because they saw us, as did General Hoy and Tripler, as we are. So be American. And then be respectful. Uh, you know, we had um, fellows at APCSS from much less advantaged backgrounds that, who would be easy to dismiss as, as you know, not. Uh, they're they're every bit as capable and every bit as committed to their to their country, and you have to respect that. I think if you do that, and then adhere to U.S. policy, you can do that. China is a different case, and perhaps Jay someday will talk about China. I still, I traveled there pre-COVID. I'm probably not going back anytime soon, but I still keep close contact with some Chinese friends and officials. You have some pictures uh, that I'm not sure we've seen all of them. The one oh. that, that impressed me most was the, the picture, the group picture. Can we show that? Yeah, so what this, is that now, General? Uh, that's me with a mustache. That's probably not what you were asking, Jay. But uh, <laughs> to my right is uh, is Ambassador Ted Osius, then U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam. And that crowd there is, um, is a group of alumni from the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies who are all military and civilian officials in Vietnam. And the ambassador hosted a reception for them, as they usually do. It's a huge alumni network, more than 10,000, maybe more than 12,000 now that COVID has ceased production for a while, if you will. Um, and uh, we had a reception with the ambassador. He talked about the importance of their work and our work at APCSS. It was, it was great, always is. I mean, I went to receptions for everywhere from Bangladesh to yeah, everywhere. Uh, but those are movers and shakers. And as you can see from the picture, they're young movers and shakers. They're the people who will influence Vietnam, its policy and development in years to come. You'll also know that several of them are women. One of the things that we did at APCSS while I was the director, and I'll take some credit because I mandated it was we more than doubled our participation of women in programs un under the UN moniker of Women, Peace, and Security. And uh, that's that's a whole nother topic, but these are people who will shape the country. They've seen the US wrapped in aloha spirit in Hawaii. They understand that what APCSS does has enabled them to do their jobs better. We, it's not a brainwashing uh, course. We don't try to force U.S. ideas on them. It's a very practical, here's how you can do things better. They teach complexity theory, negotiation skills, problem solving, um, and give them a broader view of the ocean, of the region, and then also uh, form the connections that they rely on. So... That happened, those alumni gatherings happen around the region. And, and that is a case where you can see Aloha spirits in place or Aloha shirts in places you wouldn't expect, for example, and, and see that they are learning. I'll, I'll give two quick examples. One was in Nepal. We had an alumni gathering with over 100 alumni. 
and um, there was an acting chief of mission at the embassy. And the acting chief of mission showed up about 10 minutes late on her calendar because that's how things always started. All of the alumni were already seated waiting for it to start. And she said, what happened? She said, okay, that's what we keep. You start on time. You can't do your work on time if you don't start on time. And they remember it from APCS. And almost all of them were in Aloha type, which further stunned her in Kathmandu. Um, and so you, the, the half-life of the APCS ex experience is extraordinarily long. Extraordinarily long. It's because it goes not just into the brain, but into the soul. I really believe that. Yes, I do too. The other example uh, comes from um, Myanmar. And uh, we had an alumni gathering there. And that uh, was smaller because we had just, we were about three years into our engagement with Burma slash Myanmar. And at the gathering, uh, maybe 20 people, we all gathered around and were eating poo-poos and the usual stuff. And the, uh, the uh, fellows, the alumni came up and started uh, showing me two things or doing two things. One, they showed me a picture of them sitting on my Harley Davidson, a uniquely American icon that I'd take to the center. And, you know, it's, it's, it's Americana. <laughs> yeah. And the other was they give me an update on their fellows project. So each fellow took a project that was intended to go back to their country and improve their country. This is not about the US. It's about enabling better governance throughout the world. And some of those fellows projects have led to peace agreements, earthquake preparation in Nepal, uh, you name it. So. Uh, I kind of got off on a uh, rant there, but but it, this is real work that's done that can only be done in Honolulu with the Aloha spirit. It's a perfect example of soft power. The, yeah. the Joseph um, Nye uh, soft power at the Kennedy School at, and, and Pacific Forum and I, CSIS, that's what it's all about. Uh, and so, I confess I don't like that term soft power because it's so hard and as i said in our last piece peace is hard war is easy yeah and well the successor was called smart power yeah. <laughs> so my question my last question to you general is this um so we have a change of administration we're going to have a new uh, president obviously and and we're going to have a new secretary of of defense um and it's all really interesting in light of the discussion we've been having today um, because we need to do this, this diplomatic mm -hmm. relations uh, between the military and the, uh, the, you know, the, um, the State Department. And we need to patch up some relationships, I think, and, uh, and, and, take, take, and improve some, you know, such as what we've done in Vietnam, uh, as with other countries. And so what, if, in a general sense, I guess that, that's a double entendre, in a general sense, <laughs> <laughs> What's your advice to our new Secretary of Defense? What's your advice to our new president uh, about these things, about foreign policy, about using um, you know, military, military connection uh, in order to achieve this? Well, Jay, this will surprise you, but neither President-elect Biden nor Secretary-designate Austin have called me to ask for it. So this will <laughs> be the first they're hearing it. All right. Um, I think if I were to give any uh, advice to an incoming um, president, and this goes back to your question on what's the State Department doing, I would work very quickly to fill the slate of ambassadors worldwide. I think it's so important to fill the, the offices, to get people nominated, confirmed, and then credentialed by the country that has to accept them. They're hugely important. So it's not just the military. Sure. Um, for General Austin, soon to be Secretary Austin, Senate willing, uh, I, I think my advice might surprise you. Uh, uh, it'd be two things. One, be a civilian. I'm not a fan, but General Mattis, great guy, very effective, I think, as Secretary of Defense in difficult times. 
Colonel Austin, I know a bit, but his, his credentials speak for himself, but they're not really civilians and that's a civilian position. So they have to resist the temptation to think with their uniform. Yeah, and and the other uh, another part is the Pentagon is big business, and many of the secretaries of defense did bring a business background, a deep business background that that I think is important. Now it's not without peril. Uh, some of them have not done it as well. Secretary McNamara might be an example, an example, but but it there is a business side to the Pentagon, so. I'd say get some folks around you who know business and uh, remember to be a civilian, not to either of them ask. I think there's an enormous resource in, in people like you, General, because you've seen it. It's been, you know, through your career, uh, you understand things uh, that perhaps other generations do not. And I, I hope that both the new president and the, and the new uh, Secretary of Defense can take heed from this kind of advice. In any event, we're going to continue this discussion. We're going to look at other countries and the relationships the United States has with other countries in Southeast Asia and otherwise. And I really appreciate you coming down for those discussions. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yep, I look forward to it, Jay. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and all holiday wishes to you and yours. The same. And stay well. Aloha.